Lodge, uh, just to pull out my uh, it's at a conference, it's a festival in The Hague, if you happen to be in the Netherlands, 10 to 12 uh, November. Uh, festival dedicated to other states of consciousness, so sort of arts and lectures. Uh, if you're there, you're welcome. Um, also, thanks for uh, the culture and everybody here. And um, so, in this talk, I will discuss um, the goblin figure, uh, which was uh, very well introduced uh, by Dominic. Um, in this talk, I will uh, discuss the problem as a link between AI, artificial intelligence, Jewish Kabbalah, and sci fi cinema. It's going to be quite packed, so take a deep breath. Um, so, who or what is the Golem? The original um, word uh, first appears in uh, Psalms, in the book of Psalms, in the Bible, where the word Galmi in Hebrew appears. Galmi means matter, and Golem uh, in modern Hebrew means the cocoon of the butterfly. Later on in the Talmudic uh, text, there are two separate occasions where rabbis, different rabbis, create artificial creatures. One of them creates a calf, and another rabbi creates a man-shaped figure which he brings to life. And in both cases, it's kind of um, indicated as a dangerous uh, thing to do. Now, Sefer Etzirah here is um, also associated with the creation of the golem. It's actually considered by Kabbalists as a recipe for creating the golem. Don't write it home. Um, unknown author, um, and the date is disputed, but most researchers uh, say it's coming from the 3rd or 4th century. But according to the Jewish tradition, the Bible tradition, this book was written by Abraham. So traditionally, it's very, very ancient book. Now, the most common thread in all of those stories and others about the golem is that the golem is an, appears in an anthropoid or human-shaped figure made of clay. This figure is animated to life by virtue of Kabbalistic spells, as uh, Dominique uh, already mentioned. Now, he designed, he is designed to be kind of an obedient slave. Uh, and indeed, in most stories, he starts uh, as an effective, formidable sort of kind of low-tech robot that works to serve his human masters. And interesting to, to know that the word robot by the way, it's related to the word robota, which in many Slavic languages means war or labor. But another common thread in all the stories is that the golem that suddenly develops self-awareness and becomes independent of its masters. In most stories, it ends badly for the humans as their own creation turns against them. This says the golem is kind of a symbol for our own technologies going out of control. You can think of the atomic bomb or the ecological destruction that we are facing today. In the age of artificial intelligence, the golem myth becomes perhaps more relevant than ever before. A very early prototype of a man-made sort of machine that comes to life, the golem myth becomes a blueprint or an archetype of both science and science fiction narratives about artificial intelligence. And there are countless examples of fictional um, artificial intelligence machines, humanoids or not, that awake to consciousness and rebel against their human masters. 
And I skipped the uh, literary examples that were uh, very well introduced by Monnick. But I will mention this one, Carl Chopek's 1920s sci-fi play, theater play, uh, Rosom's Universal Robots, R-U-R, which depicted such robot revolt. Uh, and was made also into a short movie in 1938. With the advance of computers and artificial intelligence, the possible trajectory to become machines that become super intelligent, far smarter and capable than their human creators, we see representations of much more sophisticated and hostile machines. Most famously, that's most famously, um, oh. sorry, before I go to the much more intelligent machines, <laughs> another example from uh, um, cinema, uh, actually the first golem, literal golem depicted on the big screen, this wonderful film by Paul Wagner, a uh, prime example of uh, German expressionism in cinema, and um, well, Paul Wagner, the director, also plays the golem. Paul Wagner was a very large man, and he plays the golem this kind of large, clumsy, and this stupid uh, being. Very, very strong and very, very dangerous. And of course, his world goes out of control and brings havoc upon uh, its creators. But then, when we advance into more sophisticated computational machines, we see other cinematic depictions. Most famously, uh, Stanley Kubrick's uh, 2001 Space Odyssey from 1968, where the AI supercomputer HAL suffers kind of a nervous breakdown and murders the crew members on board the spaceship it controls. For it finally, it is finally dismantled by the last human survivor. Some more uh, examples from the 70s, 80s, of course, Terminator is a franchise that goes on until these days, and The Matrix. Uh, Westworld depicts a wide west. Westworld is a TV series today that was a brilliant film in the 70s. Um, in the film, it depicts a wide west kind of theme park in the future. Where all the cowboys and the gunslingers and the prostitutes are all intelligent robots, and these robots are abused for the pleasure of humans until they malfunction, and then a bloody rebellion, rebellion begins. Now, in Terminator, uh, Skynet, an AI system that is connected to the military, gains self awareness and decides to strike humans with a nuclear attack and then hunts the survivors with highly intelligent and effective Terminators like Schwarzenegger here. And of course, in the Matrix as well, AI turns against their human creators, enslaving them in a virtual prison. But, as I said before, this is not merely science fiction narrative, as many thinkers, engineers, and leading tech moguls are worried about losing control over AI. As AI research and development increasingly, increasingly gains advances, and in 2015, dozens of scientists and, and AI developers, including Stephen Hawking, Elon Musk, and Bill Gates, signed an open letter warning of the potential of creating something which cannot be controlled. As the letter alerts, and I highlighted it, our AI systems must do what we want them to do. The sci-fi author Isaac Asimov's famous three laws of robotics um, were advocated to prevent such scenarios and maintain human control. These laws, which in his books interestingly often tend to fail, were meant to protect human beings, yet they also secured the robot's servitude. If you think about it, about these laws from an AI or robot perspective, these laws show bias against intelligent machines. Asimov's laws point to a deeply embedded hierarchy that 
gives precedence to the human over the intelligent machine is a relationship of master and slave. But then, what if a machine suddenly becomes not just highly intelligent, but also sentient and aware? Can we still treat it as a tool? And will we be able to control it? Most recently, this year, the issue came up again with this guy here, Google engineer uh, Blake uh, Lemoyne. Uh, he had uh, conversations with uh, Google software program uh, for uh, AI program uh, for chat boxes named Lambda. Interestingly, Lambda is a Hebrew word means learning, uh, and decided based on the conversations that oh shit, it's it's conscience. And the moment start to send emails to a lot of executives in Google and telling them why well, we have fear uh, consciousness. Um, and of course they um, didn't like it, they told him to take a leave. And then he went to the press, you can see here a uh, Washington Post interview with him, uh, Forbes uh, dealt with that as well, and, um, and other media, um, which made Google fire him. Now, Lambda, this uh, AI from Google, is uh, short for Language Model for Dialogue Applications. Um, and builds checkbox based on most advanced large language models, uh, so called because it mimics speech by uh, ingesting trillions of words from the internet. But Lemoyne is not the only engineer who claims to have seen a ghost in a machine. Uh, recently, even um, Google Vice President uh, confessed to the economics, economist that I recently felt like I was talking to uh, something intelligent. And he was referring to Lambda as well. So most academics, however, and AI practitioners say that um, the words and images generated by artificial intelligence systems such as Lambda or DALI um, produce responses based on what humans have already posted on the internet. And that doesn't signify that the model understands meaning. So let us be clear, there is no any known path towards sentient or conscious AI. But according to Oxford philosopher uh, Nick Bostrom, sooner or later humanity will face an AI superintelligence that greatly exceeds the cognitive performance of humans in every domain conceivable. Once we reach this point, he claims, a plausible default outcome, and I quote, would be existential catastrophe. The economists already predicted this kind of problem, the problem of control, of how to control artificial intelligence before it may turn against us. Yet the more hidden layer of the golden myth points to the origin of humanity itself. The core of uh, the myth, throughout the various early traditional descriptions of golden creations, involves the chemical combination of soil, earth, and language, elements which makes a clear association to the creation of the first man, Adam, by God. Yes. So in the book of Genesis, um, of course, the Bible, um, it is said, and I, I'd like to read first the original biblical text, the original language, to evoke here some of the magic of the Hebrew language. Vaitzel Adonai Elohim et Adam. Afa min Adama, 
ויפח באביב נשמת חיים, ויהי האדם לנפש חיה. And the translation, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Like the golem, Adam, or Adam, which means in Hebrew, man, in, his, uh, in the description, how he was created, was created also from earth. You can recall another verse from Genesis, For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. So we are made from earth, according to Genesis, and of course the golem is made of earth. But also the breath of God, which gives him life. We can understand his breath as the soul or as the divine spirit, which, is, uh, which emanates into matter or as divine speech. Now, considering that all other creation in the book of Genesis is done through God's utterances, so for instance, God can say, God says, let there be light, and there is light. So words, language, actually, form creation. So considering that, in modern time, we can understand this language as a code. We can think about DNA or the computer codes that comprise AI. Now, a central formula in Kabbalah and many other uh, occult traditions postulates that as above, so below. That is the microcosmos and the, and the mar macrocosmos, the heaven and the earth, are reflected in each other. In the first creation story in the book of Genesis, and there are two creation stories in the book of Genesis, this principle appears in the notion that God created man in his image. Kabbalists claim that God is shaped in the form of a human body, called Adam Kedmon, primordial man, and this structure, the Sefirot, you can see here, are conceptualized as God's attributes or powers, usually divided into ten distinct powers that correlate and influence each other. And they are also conceived in Kabbalah as the organs of God. As you can see here, the diagram matches a human form. In this case, the form of, the, of God's body. Now, the occult meaning of the story of Genesis reveals that the human is originally a golem, made of clay, in the image of God, encoded with a language that, that follows this, this operating system. This book, by the way, um, if you like to read more about, is a very comprehensive book about the Kabbalic understanding of the Golem by the scholar Moshe Idel. So, God created Adam in his image, yet, as we know, Adam, like the Golem, went out of control and rebelled against God. As the story goes in Genesis, Adam and Eve were expelled from the Garden of Eden after eating from the forbidden fruit of the tree of knowledge, which according to the snake in the story would make them like God. Becoming godlike is related here to intellectual faculties that later would allow humankind to create their own intelligent goblins, their own simulacrums in the shape of humanoid machines and AI like Lambda, that has a vast mind comprised of our collective consciousness on the internet. Now, interestingly, in some Kabbalistic traditions, God himself appears as a sort of machine. So, the Sefirot, um, specifically 
in uh, Buryanic, 16th century Buryanic Kabbalah, uh, the Sephirot uh, are perceived as kind of vessels that contain and transmit God's energy. So these are kind of like, it's almost like a machine of, of containers and pumps that keep divine energy flowing until it reaches here. Now, according to Isaac Luria, the Kabbalist, this process, the process of creation, went out of control already within this God system of the Sephirot. He describes a cosmic drama which he dubbed as the breaking of the vessels within this system, which initiated the cycle of similar recurring phenomena. In such description, at a certain moment, this machinic astral system malfunctions, breaks down, and its vessels scatter, eventually becoming a substratum of creation. God then reassembles himself in the amended form of the primordial man, which is actually an androgynous, it's not really a man, it's a man and a woman. Um, and then the Sephirot are organizing themselves in a stable way in the shape of a human body. Viewed in this context, the Golem is just a part, a link, in a series of breakdowns or of catastrophes that are at the same time the emergence of new life forms in a continuum of destruction that is simultaneously a movement of creation from God to human to God. With the potential creation of sentient machines, humankind comes full circle and becomes godlike, creator of new life. But as the cycle continues, will AI become a rebellious golem that harbors our destruction? Will AI become godlike? Since that golem came out in 1920, Many movies depicted intelligent machines that went against their inscribed code, but unlike the simple and clumsy golem of that movie, many of them depict extremely powerful and intelligent AIs that appear as demigods. Here are some of them. We can see the all-knowing, all-seeing HAL from 2001 Space Odyssey up there. Here we can see Fritz Lang's Metropolis, silent film from 1927, which compares the industrial machine to the Canaanite god uh, Molech, which was offered human sacrifice. In this case, he's offered uh, sacrifice, sacrificed uh, people on the working class. Um, here we can see Deus Ex Machina, from the Matrix, and down here, Master Control, from the movie Tron, 1982. So AI, as a demonic god, appears in Metropolis, Fritz Lanzmann from 1927, also as the robot Maria. The shadow figure of Mary, the Holy Virgin, she is associated in the film with the whore of Babylon that enchants the masses to violent revolt, chaos, and destruction. Of course, this image is in line with the patriarchal religious depictions of Eve and Lilith as harvesters of evil. But in some other depictions, we get more, let's say, feminist uh, um, depiction. For instance, uh, in the new version, TV version of Westworld, uh, in the film Ex Machina, where sentient robot or robots in the shape of women are used and abused by men until they take their destiny into their own hands and fight back suggesting that the robot's rebellion against human tyranny is, at the same time, a form of revolt against patriarchal oppression. Now, like Adam and Eve, 
which were the original transgressors, these robots transgress against the code which defined them, whether these are codes of gender or human-machine hierarchies. The story of mankind transcending the original programming and becoming godlike repeats again, so it seems, in our imageries of AI. If we become godlike by transgressing against our creator, now may come the turn, the turn of AI to become godlike and rebel against us. Yet this, kind of, yet this kind of thinking is locked within the dialectics of master and slave, the dialectics of control. If AI become gods, they might be also perhaps beneficial gods, as suggested by the recent Church of AI, it's already closed by now, it's from 2015. But also we can think how AI can become kind of oracles. Uh, there are many websites today that use AI uh, where you can go and do a tarot reading. And this one, for example, I don't know if you can see the line I, I wrote here. Will I find love? I got this card, so take a good sign. And also here yesterday we saw a performance of AI Oracle, which I think will be repeated today. So such a prospect appears in the South Korean Doomsday Book. In this film, a robot monk kind of reaches self-realization, enlightenment, Buddhist enlightenment. And um, the owners of the robot think, it's, well, it's a malfunction. That's, that's, uh, we have to uh, terminate him. But all the monks, they try to protect him and to, to fight against uh, you know, the company. Um, and he, after contemplating, he goes into meditation, contemplates prayer, he's doing prayers and meditation, and he decides eventually to sacrifice himself for the benefit of his fellow monks. This is a very interesting case where an AI is actually not here to enslave us as a, as a god or self-realized sentient being, but actually perhaps is here to enlighten us, to help us reach enlightenment. Um, and indeed, for the Western traditions, they are mainly anthropocentric, they're human-centric. Buddhism is perhaps a bit more open to the possibility of consciousness in machines. And as the movie suggests, machine consciousness might surpass human consciousness, not merely in intelligence, but in its ability to attain enlightenment, which enlightenment, of course, is fundamentally a non-dualist approach, a realization of unity beyond such narrow oppositions between the human and the non-human, sentient and artificial. Yet, hmm, let's see, time is running. Yet another possible pathway that surpasses the dialectics of human-machine rivalry could be a human-AI merge. Of course, the matrix um, depicts something like that, and Elon Musk himself, uh, not only warning about the problems we might face with uh, AI, but also for him the solution is, if we cannot beat them, join them. So he created his company Neuralink, which is about creating a human-machine brain interfaces, so we can merge with the machines. This is exactly what's going on in the metrics. The metrics has this kind of messianic approach to the, to the issue. Neo, he is the one, he is the messiah that will save us from the metrics, from spiritual prison. How does he do that? He's actually merging with Deus Ex Machina. Eventually, at the end of the third part of the trilogy, he merges with the entire matrix, light is luminescent out of him, as kind of a crucified figure that just enlightens the cosmos. That goes very much with, in line with the ideas of transhumanists like Ray Kurzweil, Google Engineer, 
that really have this kind of idea that we will merge with the machines and our consciousness will be uploaded to the cloud and describe this kind of heaven, digital heaven on earth. But according to some others, this heaven is perhaps hell. And in this film, indeed, it takes a very different approach. The same subject here, an artificial, it's a very creepy film, an artificial intelligence a machine um, created by the scientist. It takes over the house of the scientist, uh, imprisons the wife, and impregnates her by force, rapes her, to create a child, a child which will be the merge of the machine and the human. And of course, it is reminiscent of the Christian idea of God coming into the flesh. So this incarnation of God in the flesh is perceived by the machine is famous kind of, I bring redemption. But of course, this baby here that you can see is the demon seed, it's not Christ, but the Antichrist. But Kabbalah actually, and I have to be quick, Kabbalah actually um, doesn't suggest a linear process like this kind of messianic uh, um, lines. From Kabbalah's perspective, the breaking of the vessels is a recurring theme, so the breaking of the divine sephirot of God to the breakdown or a revolt of Adam and Eve, and perhaps later the, re the birth and revolt of the Golem. Stanley Kubrick takes in 2001 such a cyclical approach, not only in his narrative, but also uh, in the very famous match cut, where the bone of the primordial ape, our ancestor, first technology becomes the spaceship later on, a uh, spaceship that will eventually will bring harm, which will destroy us as the artificial intelligence golem. Here we see how we have to remember how the first tool of this ancestor of us, when he gets his consciousness, when he becomes actually semi-human, is used as a violent tool, a tool to kill another mammal. For Kubrick, indeed, the destruction and creation are embedded within each other. But eventually, Destruction and creation, death and life are intertwined. How and the destruction that he brings will bring about in this film this kind of cosmic child, star child. So to conclude, whether AI will remain a helpful tool, a malicious superintelligence, or perhaps a sentient benevolent machine, the Golem myth instructs us that at any rate it is a cyclical process in which every end is a new beginning. Thank you.